Hey, it's Jordan with TYT and TYT Politics. I am here with Spotted Eagle of the Faith Spotted Eagle of the Ihangtua tribe. Uh, I'm Faith Spotted Eagle uh, from the Ihangtua band of the Ocheti Shakoi. And you've been a fixture here. I've seen you in my five times. You're all, you're, you just have a face of a wise woman. And uh, this ceremony today was very powerful. Uh, it featured uh, veterans, uh, water protectors, uh, everybody trying to come together, and veterans uh, on behalf of the nation asking uh, indigenous and Native Americans for forgiveness for all of our original sins. Could you talk to me about what you were, what you were feeling during that moment? I think today was a day of remembrance uh, for my father, who was a World War II veteran. He served in the South Pacific, and through my childhood, I learned what he was carrying with his PTSD. But he did a marvelous job of healing through our uh, traditional culture. And so I got into working with veterans through what my father experienced, and I didn't know that would come by, I suppose, divine design because suddenly I was serving as a PTSD therapist for VA centers and working with not only native veterans, but veterans at large and staff members in VA centers. So I feel really, um, I guess, protective and I feel um, honored. I always feel honored every time I do a group with the veterans, but I've been doing this for 15 years. And so it was a marvelous thing for them to intersect with the Ocheti Shakoi who have all of us in Ocheti Shakoi have PTSD. So yeah, you made a joke where your your PTSDs unite. Yes, our PTSDs are uniting in healing, uh, laughter, pain, dancing, celebrating, uh, going to ceremonies and with the f goal of saving water. And Miniwi Choni is the water of life. So we have a joint purpose here because everybody needs water. And uh, what I find interesting is I think a lot of Americans who are not Native have a hard time forgiving and letting go. Uh, a lot of people are struggling uh, economically, socially. Uh, last 10 to 20 years, uh, they've lost, lost a lot of their uh, income. They've lost um, their homes due to, due to greed. And they have a lot of animosity towards government officials and corporate power. Uh, but so many Native Americans here uh, that I've met uh, operate on prayer and forgiveness. Can you kind of talk about that? And uh, what, what can non-Natives learn uh, in your way of life? I think with so much trauma, if you continue to allow that trauma to bury you, there's, it continues to play itself out in early death. Uh, violence, accidents, hurting each other on the reservation. And I think we're at a point in time where enough is enough. And we realize that this historical trauma is definitely not about ourselves. And I think the thing that the VA taught me when I went to work with them, I thought that Native people had the monopoly on PTSD. And I got into the VA and I thought, whoa, this is like a whole different field. And then they come from all over in America. And then I sort of woke up and I looked around and I thought, we live in a very violent country. And so oppression is the name of the game. Capitalism is the name of the game. Uh, eco killing is the name of the game. And so it became almost like a relief in a sense to think it wasn't me personally. And I think that's a message a lot of our people have to embrace that it is not about us it's about a very old violent way of living that was never healed so when the colonists came to the shores of our country they had been injured but they never healed so they inflicted the same injury so in a way it was secondary trauma but pretty soon it became a holocaust so it's very important for america and the people the non-native vets that are here their goal their uh, focus in life needs to be about coming out of denial my needs, my goal as Native people, we need to come out of rage because we, anger is a natural human emotion, but it's, um, anger can be justifiable anger. You can channel it like the vets here coming here. They're going to do that and they are while they're here. But if it grows to rage, then it's out of control. So that's the, the insight that can be gained from that.
And, um, you know, it's interesting because I've been here for a few weeks and uh, my fifth time, and non-natives looking at the grisly, horrible scenes are stunned that this could be happening in America, that such lawlessness, human rights violations, just total disregard for humanity could happen. Not a surprise to Native Americans. Uh, can you kind of talk about everything that's transpired here? And do, do you want to see uh, consequences? Uh, and, uh, you know, what, what does it mean that in America you could have this uh, assault on unarmed people um, and there be no consequences so far? I think that the American people need to police themselves because uh, truly, if they police themselves, they will begin to regain their conscience because it's not my conscience, it's theirs. And as I sit here, I am a survivor of violence. In 1974, uh, shortly after Wounded Knee, I was in a place at the wrong time, wrong place, but it was in a border town. And because of the violence that happened at Wounded Knee, there were a lot of non-native people that um, didn't like to be around in native people and they would uh, inflict violence on anybody who was in a town there where there were not very many native people and I w ended up getting attacked by five non-native men and I had four friends with me and ten in 10 minutes I had a broken leg so and that happened in 1974 and when I think about it I always think about my left leg sometimes I'll touch my leg and I'll think did that really happen that somebody kicked me so hard that my leg broke and so after that happened, I thought, no one can hurt me anymore. I already got my leg broken, so I don't care. I don't care. It's done. And I'll just go forward. And I know what it feels like. And I don't want that to happen to anybody else. And I particularly don't want to do that to anyone else, even if I have been discriminated against. Because after, and I have PTSD, and after I began to realize that if I was going to help people with their PTSD, I couldn't take people where I hadn't been. And in order for me to help them, I have to be in a place of knowing what it feels like to heal. And so I had to, I used to be a red supremist, and I felt like I needed to figure out how I had to channel that, that rage and, and anger. And you know, it's just so strange how Creator works because shortly after I got my leg broken, I was in a state of rage. You know how they talk about road rage? I was not a very nice person to be around, and it came out at the most inopportune times. But I was driving one day, and I got uh, these two little non-native girls well, drove in front of me, and then started making war hoops. I have no idea why people make war hoops. No native people do that. I don't know where they got that. Maybe from John Wayne movies or something. But they started making war hoops, and then they fingered me. And I thought, oh my God, and my, I just went out of it. And I don't even remember. So I followed them into this parking lot. I proceeded to call them names and I got violent, hit the window, told them not to ever do that to a native person. Then I came to and I looked around and everybody was staring at me and I thought, oh my gosh, I lost it. I just blanked out. So I thought I really need to take care of myself. So I began processing what happened, letting my anger out. So long story short, I come back to South Dakota 20 years later, I'm driving down the freeway. These two little girls go around me, and I swear it was the same two little girls. 30 years later, they made war hoops, they fingered me, and I thought, I'm having a flashback. I thought this happened before, and so I thought, and my feeling wasn't the same. I didn't have any hurt, anger, pain, and I followed them off the freeway, and I followed them to a high school. They got out of the car. I still didn't have any anger, and I went into the school, and I told the principal, I said, these little girls just caused a road hazard. I mean, they just, this is not okay. I'm a mom, I'm a grandma, and I need to talk to them about what they did. And so, think about it, 30 years later, after something like that, where I had lost it, and then I just felt an element of, they just don't know. And when I saw the girls come into the school, they said, I said, y you shouldn't be doing that to, especially an elder. And they said, it's your word against mine. And then they just kind of flipped me off and they went in. But the principal, bless his heart, he brought them out and he made them apologize to me. And I just saw them as ordinary um, children. And I hope it was a teachable moment. I don't know, but at least I tried. But it was crazy that Creator had me go through that again 30 years later. So. And, uh, you know, it's even though there's been a uh, short-term victory here, 
Uh, obviously, we need to keep vigilant to make sure this pipeline doesn't go through. Uh, it's not like oppression of Native Americans just ended yesterday. It's not like uh, economic uh, justice or environmental justice, social justice has been achieved. Um, I think a lot of people were awoken to the plight of the Native Americans more so than ever before. Uh, what would you like to see happen in terms of uh, making a lot of things, uh, at least getting to the point where we're starting to make things more uh, equal and just uh, for our Native Americans? First of all, I think that the, the worldwide awakening needs to continue because it is beyond us. It, it reaches out to Mother Earth because if we don't wake up and address this climate change that's going on, we're, we're not even going to be here. And so that's the worldwide message. The secondary message is that we have been veterans of war in this country and that this Holocaust has attacked our, our bodies. When, you are, when Mother Earth is rapable, women and children are rapable. And that's why usually in war, the ones that are most vulnerable are the women and children, and it's played it out in our, our history and our culture. So I think that in America, what we need to do is reconcile the denial the guilt and begin to say we all need water our children the worst thing in the world for a grandmother like me to even envision is to hear my grandson say grandma I want water and I wouldn't be able to give him water that is not polluted I mean I can even imagine how the people in Flint Michigan feel about their grandchildren being affected that would just destroy me I so I think uh, for the generations, we're doing this for my grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren. And I would hope that America would realize that. And maybe that's who I need to speak to as the elders of this country, no matter what race, is that you really do have to talk to your grandchildren, no matter how old they are, if they're 40, if they're two, to say, we, we have to make relationship with Mother Earth and we have to make relationship with the trauma that we feel about other ethnic groups and races and neighbors in our community because the world, all of this is larger than us. We are so minuscule in the overall design of the universe. We're put here to be relatives, tribal relatives, and that's why we have that tribal word, um, all my relatives. And so Ocheti means um, fires, all of the fires. Shakoe means the seven council fires. So the most recent governance form, which was in the 1800s, was seven council fires. And under there, there were sub councils. But some of the older people say that sometimes we had up to 23 or 28 in the federation. And they didn't always meet like on scheduled times or even sometimes annually. But when a call was put out to the people that it was a time of crisis and that decisions made to, had to be made, like in this instant climate change and the water, then the Ocheti would come to revive. In this situation, the Ocheti is a little bit different because when we put the call out to our people, it's like all the nations on earth responded. Before it used to be only the seven council fires. So I think that's an indication that there is a need for these type of gatherings to address these worldwide concerns. And the difference is it's not a capitalistic organization. It's neo, not neo-capitalism. And it's not the industrial complex that is call, calling the meeting to order. It's the grassroots people that live out on the land. 